Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Trisha O'Malley. Yes, we do. And it was a lovely interview. Just so yes. great. Yes, we talked about a lot of interesting things that we hadn't talked yes. about a whole lot before. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the main thing was, um, or the one thing that I think is most memorable was she talked about how she designed her perfect day. Mm-hmm. And then she built her writing lifestyle around that. Mm-hmm. And um, I said that was very cool. Yeah, I think it is too. And and that's actually our question of the week. Like, what is your perfect day? Tell us what that would look like. And, um, but I love it because, you know, she just, yeah, she, she decided what it was she wanted to do best, you know, wanted to do Mm -hmm. the most with her life. And then she set out to create that and has and lives on this beautiful island with her Scottish uh, fiance and her dogs. And it's just a great interview. And Trisha is super successful and Mm -hmm. super smart. And she's done some things that have been really strategic. Uh, I liked what she said about how she took her books and put them into KU. Um, that wasn't the original plan, but she, she did it and she's just done amazing, uh, W- amazing things with those books. So, um, yeah, I yeah, just love the interview. Yeah. And she's very strategic with using things that she enjoys, incorporating those into her books. So she talks yes. about how she likes to do underwater photography. Mm-hmm. And so she sent us some pictures. So if you go to the mm-hmm. show notes, you'll be able to see pictures of, you know, where she lives and her underwater photography and um, just beautiful stuff. Yeah. And follow her on Instagram because she's all, she's got all kinds of amazing pictures on her uh, Instagram of her underwater photography. So, yeah. yeah. but what's going to, been going on with you this week? Well, okay. So my main, most exciting thing is I have bookcases in my office now. You do. And they Can look great. That? Oh, look, you've got a little ladder. I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I I love it that online, but yeah, I thought with this new office, I don't have a closet after since we've moved, I don't have a closet to put Mm -hmm. everything away. And I only had one bookshelf and I was like, I'm going to order me some bookshelves. So I was looking around Mm -hmm. browsing online Mm -hmm. and I saw these, it came, you could order a separate bookcase ladder with it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, done that. That's it. That's what I'm getting. (laughs) Pretty soon you'll be in your bell outfit sliding across the (laughs) world. So that's the most exciting thing that's happened. So I got those. And then um, I am still working. I'm, you know, getting to do new words for the new series. That's great. I'm working on the new book. And I'm also um, working on Mystery Books podcast. I recorded a couple of episodes. So that'll be starting up again. So things are kind of getting back to normal. That's great. That's great. Yeah. What about you? Well, I've been on vacation. Uh, Actually, to, I got home today. It's Sunday, uh, mm-hmm. the first, and I have been gone from my house for two weeks. Uh, the first <laughs> week, uh, well, first five days, I was at the beach with my mom and two of my sisters, or three of my sisters, I guess. And um, we spent five days there. Then I went back to my daughter's house and stayed there for three days in Dallas, uh, helping them because they've had some things going on that were pretty heavy and pretty big, um, and have turned out to be very exciting in our life, but just a lot of stress and, um, Mm -hmm. stuff. And then I was there for four days and then I left last Sunday to go to Mexico with my mom and two of my sisters and their daughters. And we went to a resort and have been there all week and it was wonderful and relaxing. And I did nothing. Um, (laughs) we went snorkeling and, uh, did one excursion on Friday, but other than that, we sat at the pool all day and just enjoyed ourselves. So it was really great. And it was great to get to spend that time with my mom and sisters. Um, I don't get that. And um, I don't know a lot of 
some people know, but my, one of my sisters is, uh, has cancer and it was, she got to go on the trip and, um, it was just good to have time with, with them and, uh, really precious time. And I'm very, very grateful about that. Um, but my book is also at the editor still. So it, I sent it to the editor the night before we left to go to Mexico. So it is, I'll get it back this coming weekend. And, um, yeah, so so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I've got a, yeah, I've got a lot of things to set up this week for the release and uh, just, you know, some promo stuff that I, I'm going to do beforehand. And yeah, so yeah, you know, so never, excellent timing. Excellent timing. It really kind of worked out perfectly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you should always um, go on a trip when your book goes to the editor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I highly recommend it. Uh, I didn't really think about it or writing or anything for about three days, which was nice. That's so just kind of had that. And then after that, I started getting ideas for the next book. And mm-hmm. and of course, when you're in a beautiful place with a lot of different kinds of people all around, some mm-hmm. are not that some not on their best behavior. Uh, you get <laughs> ideas for other books. So that, is, that was kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, so, that is great. Sometimes yeah. it's like the time away is the most mm-hmm. productive, even though you don't feel like you put in any words. Right. Those ideas and plot plot points and yeah. just different things. That's really good. Yeah. 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 And um I will t- I will say tell this that uh, last month I um had someone um doing my ads for uh, AMS. I I decided to get somebody to do that. And it turned out that those ads was really hard to get those ads profitable. Um, I don't know if it's because I don't have enough books to carry, um, to cover kind of the cost per click that you need to get, you know, I don't really know exactly what it is, but I decided not to continue with that but we left the ads the profitable the ones that were showing some profit running um and over this past week they have more than doubled my money this week so um so it's going to be a small trickle as opposed to a big game changer but i'm really happy that i have some ads that are continuing to work Mm -hmm. that are so you got to kind of have to take things as they come and you know, take yeah. the small trickle and try to build on that in other ways. But um, yeah, I, right now it just does not seem like AMS is the place that's going to make me all the money. Uh, right. Facebook but, still seems to be that place for me. Yeah. So, but I'm glad I tried with someone uh, and they did a great job and I'm very happy about it. But I just um, felt like with the release coming up, I couldn't really... Mm-hmm. You know, but you can, you probably want to focus on the release, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what you If it had been a different time, I might have continued on another month and just seen what we could have done. But mm-hmm. right now, I feel like with the release, I wanted yeah. to, uh, yeah, focus yeah, on it. Yeah. yeah, focus on that, your attention and your money. And then mm-hmm. later, you can switch it up again if you yeah. need to. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But we're going to, right now, we're going to, I mean, he's going to, even though, you know, I haven't hired him for this month. He's going to kind of keep monitoring them a little bit. I'll monitor them and mm-hmm. we'll just see if they, if they continue to be profitable, I'll just let them run. Yeah. Um, because again, it's not huge money, but it's, it's good money. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, a, it's like a, like if you can get a toehold kind of with mm-hmm. Amazon ads and kind of get them mm-hmm. going mm-hmm. and get them delivering to the right people. Yes. Then I think yes. You, you can at least get a low level, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know what you call it, like a low level funnel of tra- traffic mm-hmm, going to your mm-hmm. pages. And so that mm-hmm. can help. And I don't know that there's a really, no, I don't think anybody's found a really good way to turn that up, mm-hmm. you know, like where you can really increase the spend and increase. Like you know, supersize it. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. more like, yeah, for me, it's, if I can get some going that are good, I just keep them going low level mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So Anyway, that's what's been going on with me. Not not okay. a whole not a whole lot of writing, but a lot of ideas. Again, um, we were on a cruise. I mean, we were on a, a catamaran cruise with some people that um, overindulged, and <laughs> their behavior was not great. And uh, that's going in a book. I'm just going to tell you that right now. That's so. the great thing about being a writer is anything <laughs> that happens is like even if it's funny, embarrassing. <laughs> you know, or a horrible disaster. There've been things yeah. that have happened. I'm like, okay, yeah, that is definitely That's going in a like, book. Yeah. something makes me so mad. And I'm like, 
<laughs> that is going in the next book, and that person will be the one who dies. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, it's good to be home. I mean, I just got home, but it's good yeah. to be home. My dogs were happy to see me and my husband, and you know, so it's always so, good. But good. I'm tired and a little sunburned, so I'm going to take today so and rest. It was a great vacation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, we should but, get uh, on with the interview. That's and right. And don't forget to answer the question of the week. You can come into yes. the Facebook group and do that. And um, it's, what is your perfect day? So mm-hmm. it doesn't have to Tell be all about related it. to writing because mm-hmm. Trisha certainly isn't. She has... Mm-hmm. Plenty of other things she does during the day besides writing. So that's right. Here, All so right. here is Trisha. Today we are really excited to talk to Trisha O'Malley. Hi, Trisha. How are you? I'm good. How are you? We are doing good. We're great. Yeah, we're so happy you're here. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, we're excited to talk to you about all kinds of interesting and different things that we haven't talked about before. So, yeah. so exactly incorporating things into your work that are a little unusual. So let me read your bio and we'll get started. Trisha O'Malley is a New York Times, USA Today, and Wall Street Journal bestselling author of contemporary romance, paranormal romance, and cozy mystery novels. She lives in the Caribbean with her handsome Scotsman and their much doted on dogs. (laughs) That's awesome. That's awesome. So tell us how you got into writing. So I definitely had what we would call an inciting incident. (laughs) Uh, My dog, yes, my dog got (laughs) stolen is how I started writing. Stolen? Yes, stolen. Oh, gosh. Yes. And so uh, it was a particularly traumatic few weeks. And there was something about uh, the experience where I was so relentless and focused and Um, just really wanted to get him back home and I was able to recover him. He was returned to us anonymously and we adopted another dog along the way and there was psychic interventions and death threats and he, you know, the news carried it and it was this whole thing, but it would just really sort of had this great uh, renewed my purpose in like believing that you can change the outcome of something if you work hard enough. And so I just had got it in my head that I'm going to write this story And if something comes of it, fine. If something doesn't, fine. But what I wanted to do was just raise some money for animal shelters and maybe just help other people who are in that situation. And so Mm -hmm. I wrote, I I didn't know, I was new to the industry as a whole. So I kind of wrote an outline, started doing the querying of agents and that kind of stuff. And then I had been doing research and discovered keyboards at that time. And I just put, sort of like a line in the sand of if after this date, like no agents want this, I'm going to move forward with self-publishing. I'm just, I'm going to give it a go, see what happens. And so none of the agents were interested and I, that was coming up on NaNoWriMo. So I just said, Mm -hmm. I'm going to write this book. And then um, I don't know if you know the book author, publisher, entrepreneur by Guy Kawasaki. Mm -hmm. It was I've heard of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know if it's up to date now, but at the time it was sort of it was this like 450 page behemoth of a book about the publishing industry. And I actually reached out to him as an author and he responded and he was really helpful. Uh, oh, so I just awesome. took that book with me to the coffee shop every day until I got through it, took all my notes, read up on keyboards and I published my first book and just went with it and said, OK, I'm going to see what happens. And then. I continued to study on keyboards, continued to see what they were doing. Um, and I about maybe eight months after I published The Stolen Dog, I ran a big book bug feature and did all of the advertising that was recommended, hit the New York Times bestseller list, and then went, okay, now what? <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't think my dog was going to get stolen again. So now what are we supposed to write about? <laughs> A unique form of writer's block right there. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I, I was stuck. Um, yeah. Well, that is yeah. interesting. But that was that was initially what started me, yes, with writing. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but then you've got to write fiction after that, right? Yes. But 
what hung me up a little bit is I still hadn't given myself permission to write, you know, the books of my heart and what I really loved reading. Mm -hmm. And I had been coming out of the corporate world at that moment at that time. I was just in 2007. I'd been laid off. I was a paralegal and it was like when everything crashed and there was cuts all around. And so I just thought, well, I'm going to keep pursuing this, but I didn't, it took, I, I just was convinced that I had to write more business or more serious kind of stuff to be taken seriously. So initially I started writing marketing guides because I also had a marketing background. And so I started writing these little like marketing guides for different stores and different businesses and self-publishing those. And of course Mm. they went nowhere, but it was, I just thought, okay, I got to keep this momentum going. I don't know what to do next. And then um, I finally, I woke from a dream in Ireland when I was traveling and that was the beginning of the mystic cove series. So I wrote it down on a note paper that was like in the hotel and (laughs) just woke up the next day. I said, I'm going to write this story. But prior to writing that, I said, I really got to test this market because I don't trust myself um, to write fiction really. Like I wrote a story I already knew it had good reviews, but that was played out in real real life. I could just write it. Um, so then I did a pen name and I wrote like short story romances and did that for like six, seven months, just under a pen name and just kept testing the market, taught myself how to do the book covers, taught myself how to write blurbs, taught myself how to, what my voice was a little bit, how to kind of build connection with my characters. And I just kept publishing you know, these like 20,000, 30,000 romantic shorts. And just until I started making about a thousand dollars a month. And then I said, okay, now I'm giving myself permission to go out under my name. Mm -hmm. I published a prequel novella, Wild Irish Heart and Wild Irish Eyes all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Once I was ready. And I think that was like the fall of 2014. Mm-hmm. And then it was like, I hit the ground running. And so I was just following keyboards and what other authors like Rosalind James and other ones were mm-hmm. doing, they were building up their series. Mm-hmm. And I, and I just kept publishing um, that series through 2015. I did five books in that series. And I also introduced my cozy mystery series that summer. And then in the fall of 2015, I ran I made the first book perma-free, ran a huge book bub, uh, along with a bunch of other advertising, hit, I think, 65, 70K in a month and went, and then it just took off. Wow. And so that changed everything. It was like, okay, you're, you're a writer now. (laughs) (laughs) Got to go. Yeah. Let's reiterate that 65 to 70K a month. That's just amazing. That will, that was in that month, that first month. So that was my first six figure year. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, but that was the one saying it's, it's, this is what you're doing now. Like mm-hmm. you're in this and keep going. Yeah. And- that's pretty good confirmation that you should be on this path. <laughs> <laughs> well, that leads nicely into our next question, which is what is your definition of success? Mm-hmm. So for me, I am not hugely, hugely motivated by money. I, and I say that in a way that of course it's, nice to have money because obviously you want to pay your bills and take care of everything, but it's not, it's, I don't, I never had a benchmark or a marker in my head that I had to make this much. And then it would be, so my definition of success was um, when I started out, I kind of had to define what I was working for. And for me, that was really flexibility and freedom, which obviously money does provide. But um, so I wrote down what my perfect day was years ago. And this was even before I started writing uh, my series that features a scuba diver, but I wrote down what my perfect day would look like. And that was, I wanted to live somewhere where I could get up, go scuba diving in the morning, Mm -hmm. grab a nice coffee, and then write in the afternoon. And I just kept it really easy and loose, but it was just sort of that freedom of day where I could split something I'm really passionate about, like in a hobby. And then also something I'm passionate about in work, but I I could adjust that schedule as I wanted. I could make my day how I wanted. And I just, I think because I've been coming out of a corporate world that oftentimes you were stuck, 
you know, if even if there was no work to do, you had to stay there till five. Yeah. And I would mm-hmm. around everyone and say, Hey, does anyone have any work? Can I help with anything? <laughs> what can I do? I'm like, I'm just sitting here. And it just seems such a pointless, like waste of time. Yeah. And so just having that flexibility, like if I could have worked somewhere that, you know, you can just walk out the door when you're finished with your work, like how much more efficient would that have been? Correct. And so to me, just having flexibility and freedom has always been my definition of success. So okay. And I'm happy to say that I have made my perfect day. I'm now living it. So that's awesome. That's yeah. great. So tell us what you wish you'd known about writing and craft when you started. Um, there's a few things. I would say the first was the biggest one, and this is something that I just really have given myself permission in the last year and a half, is that I don't always have to do things the way that I've always done. And mm. so I think um I convinced myself for a while there that however I wrote books was, I wrote it kind of like I'm cramming for the exam in college. So Mm -hmm. if I had a deadline, I would do nothing until the week before and then write an entire book and me kicking and screaming over the finish line. And um, that's just not a great way to write books. And so, but it was how I was always doing it. It was working for me. But it was, I think, just shortly into the pandemic with all of the other stress around. And I was writing a book like that. And I said, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do it this way anymore. And I just realized that I don't have to do it that way (laughs) anymore, that I could change my process. And I think as writers, we often, I don't know if it's just, we convince ourselves that this is the only way that this is going to work for me, or I can't, I can't possibly work in a coffee shop or I can't work here. I can't do this. And you kind of get these things built up in your head. And so I just realized that I could absolutely change my process. And so I did, and I've been more efficient and less stressed and much more productive since I did. Well, I have to ask you, what's your process now? Well, so my process now is I just have to write one chapter. Oh, okay. So I get up, go to my office and I just have to write one chapter you know, about five days a week. And usually it's more, but it's just, just one chapter and don't worry about it. Don't stress if it's not a day that it's not flowing. Mm -hmm. If you can get a lot more in, that's great. And then it's just made it really easy. Mm -hmm. How much easier in a way that I wasn't expecting. I know people have always said, there's the writers who say write every day or write first thing in the morning or always get a thousand words in. I don't always stick to that, but generally now I'm trying to just chunk it down into really small actionable steps so instead of you know Anne Lamott has that great quote about being overwhelmed and Mm -hmm. having a project for three months that could have been done and doing it the night before it's the same thing like I don't sit down and think about writing a whole book I just sit down and think about what's got to happen in this next chapter right bird by bird yeah bird by bird yeah. Yeah. I think that's so true though. Like, it, it also ties back to your um, like not having to work eight hours a day. And yes. that's something that it took me a long time to figure out that like, because I'm, you know, I'm, I was a good employee and I did, you know, I did all my work and I stayed at my desk and I did my stuff. And so when I started writing, I felt I needed to be writing from eight until five. And it was like, when I figured out, Hey, I don't have to do this. I can, I can take off for three hours in the afternoon and do whatever I want. You know, it's like, I can fix my schedule the way I want. It's just very freeing. It's wonderful. So it's extremely freeing, but putting boundaries on your time is so important too. Yeah. And that's been another big thing is initially once I went full-time as an author, I wish I would have known to say no more frequently because when you're home, everyone thinks, oh, can you pick up the dry cleaning? Can you do this? Can you, I'm just going to swing by real quick or, you know, all of those things. And so that was another thing is learning to say no and protect my time as if I was working in an office and people wouldn't just swing by and bug me, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah. It's a weird dichotomy. Cause like, I would take it very seriously. Like I have to be here and do this, but then other people would not. So it's very strange. Like you have to figure out how to work that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what about marketing? What do you wish you had known about marketing? 
Um, I wish I would have known one that it's okay to spend money on ads. Yeah. <laughs> it, took me, <laughs> it took me a while to give myself permission to actually spend money on advertising. Um, and obviously it has been very fruitful for me, but I think just initially when you see how much advertising can end up running, it's, it makes you stop a little bit and go, are we sure we should be doing this? And yeah, right. Um, but now I'm much more comfortable with it. And also back matter. Hmm. I, I had no idea, like I, back matter has worked for me with like newsletter signups and that kind of stuff. But in one of my books recently, I just put a question of my readers just asking like, Hey, did you want to hear more about this particular story? And I published that book probably eight months ago. And I get anywhere from two to five emails a day about that book because <laughs> I haven't I haven't followed up with it yet because I've been on, on my it's different schedule yeah. and I just realized how much more people are actually really interacting with your back ma- back matter mm-hmm. well that's good to hear because sometimes I wonder if people actually get to it you know it's like I have links and stuff there but you know sometimes you get to the last page and then you get prompted to review like to rate or review or you know like the retailer puts stuff in there and so I'm always wondering, like, I know I read everything. I want the back matter. I want all that. But I do wonder how many people actually keep going. So that's good to hear that. And I like the idea of doing a question too. That's very cool. That's yeah. the thing. I think asking the question really prompted people to think about it and think what they wanted and respond. And so it's like going to be more work on your end because you <laughs> <laughs> more responses to reply to. But right. yeah. it, it definitely prompted more interaction. Oh, that's, that's a great idea. I've never even considered that because yeah. I, I agree with you. I think back matter is so important. And I think it's where a lot of authors um, miss the mark sometimes. And I've been guilty of it, you know, putting too much or not giving, uh, giving the reader too many options. And uh, <laughs> I'm terribly, <laughs> I'm terribly guilty of that. And so But when you can kind of really focus it and then have this question that you can then build on, perfect. Mm -hmm. That's great. So what assumptions? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think definitely, particularly when it's asking their opinion of where they might want to see a story go or something they would like, Mm -hmm. you're getting a little bit more in tune with what your readers are wanting. So I was very surprised by that. So that's great. Yeah. I love that idea. Now, now my mind is. (laughs) <laughs> um, so what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and have they turned out to be right or wrong? Um, well, one of them was that I think I, in that first big year that I was just kind of pumping out books, mm-hmm. I did start another series in a different genre. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I did it under the same name because I just assumed readers would cross over mm-hmm. and of mine have, but a lot of them don't. So it was one of those things that I just had to understand that I was essentially cultivating different audiences Mm -hmm. and both have been successful for me, not having to, um, you know, bounce between pen names, Mm -hmm. but I just, I had thought it would be a little bit easier. And so it was definitely something because I read everything I read. Me too. uh, books and, you know, uh, true stories and romance and mystery. And so I just assume all readers have the same reader pattern. Nope, they do not. So, and it wouldn't matter to me. Like if I really loved an author, I would want to see what they did with a paranormal or Mm -hmm. something else. You know, if I loved a romance of theirs, I would want to see, Hey, how does her voice then, you know, transfer into this? But no, a lot of readers, readers aren't like that. They're very genre loyal. So. Yes. <laughs> so it was that was a bit of a learning curve. And I kind of, you know, I've muscled through it. Uh, but it was definitely something to learn that you're, you really truly are cultivating different right. audiences and people will stay in their lane. Right. Readers t- tend to stay in their lane yeah. really well. Mm-hmm. Writer, as writers, we're not good at it. <laughs> we're there <laughs> and all over the place. No, we are. <laughs> Finding readers between romance series, even yeah. in the same genre, is tricky. Yeah, you know, they get the they get the world attachment and the character attachment with different series, and they just want more of that series. Yeah. And so, trying, you know, I have a tendency. I write, I bounce between series instead of just writing straight through. 
And it's, you kind of got to drag them along a little bit. It's the fourth or fifth book in a a new series before they finally go, okay, okay, okay. It's like, obviously she's going to keep writing this. So I guess I'll try it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that's important too. Like, and we've talked about this a hundred times, but writing a series within a series or having some crossover characters or, or at least mentioning people in one series that are in another series that can help. But yeah, for the most part, people are like, they're just pretty loyal. Yeah. (laughs) So I was going to ask, have you noticed a difference in like your romance read, like people who are romance readers and mystery readers for the series option do like, I feel like mystery readers want the series to continue. Like they kind of expect the series to go on. Whereas in other genres, it may have a hard ending point. Like, Hey, this is a three book series. Do you see a difference in your mystery and romance readers as far as how they feel about series? Um, I would say, so I think the big thing I see more is that in, but in both, in both, all, I would say all of my worlds, actually, um, people want to return to the world. So they're attached. They want to go back. But there doesn't seem to be, because they love the world, they just, they'll ask like, okay, can't this person fall in love now? And what about this person? And what about the bartender's daughter who we just met in that one chapter? What about she should fall in love now? And then in the mystery series, people just want to go back and like revisit old friends. And so the one thing in that one, they want... They also want, you know, the characters to advance in their lives. So that's the ones where you have to, are they getting married? Are they having any character growth? And you have to pay a lot more attention. Yeah. Whereas obviously in romance, you can, your characters get the happily ever after at the end of that book. Mm -hmm. And so um, definitely would say that, no, people, they, they come back to the world. It's really what they want to see. They want it both in romance, if they love your town or your world Mm -hmm. you create. They like that as equally as much as the mysteries. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. I love series, love talking serious stuff. So I have to ask. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So um, one question we really like to ask is, have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Maybe like not necessarily a mistake is kind of a harsh word, but like lessons learned. <laughs> you should know, probably change it, but we, we keep it in. <laughs> Well, I, I, I was looking at that question and I was thinking, I mean, I know mistakes that have happened that were just those, oh, shoot moments. Yes. <laughs> Before I took over formatting of my novels, I had a formatter bring a manuscript back to me and I published it just oh, wow. thinking like it was done because that was the finished manuscript. She had taken the the file from the book before it. So I published the next book and chapter 14 was the chapter from the book prior. Mm. Because I didn't read through, you know, you get your formatted file back. You just look at the chapter headings. Is everything nice? Whatever. Mm -hmm. So people were immediately emailing. They've been so excited about this book. They're like, we don't understand what happens. (laughs) We're so confused. (laughs) Um, But so those are those, oh, shoot moments that, you know, is like, oh, man. Um, but I would say one of the mistakes it's, it is a good thing, but it's not something I recommend for everyone is my covers do not follow genre norms. Mm. (laughs) It has made it a little tricky with advertising, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, they also really stand out. So I don't know whether to say that's good or bad. I it's the, you know, it's the, your, your mileage may vary. So Mm. with my Irish series, they are paranormal romance. So is my Siren Island series. They're paranormal romance, but they're in this category of light paranormal. So you've got psychics and mermaids and Irish fae, and it's not shifters and vampires and werewolves, but technically they're paranormal. (laughs) However, there is no real light paranormal genre on Amazon. So you have to put it in there. So then I have, you know, an Irish cottage cover (laughs) sitting next to all the <laughs> vampires <laughs> it stands out like a sore thumb but I don't know if that also may cause a few people to pick it up so mm-hmm. and the same with my cozy mystery covers they are not cartoon covers either so it's it has made it a little bit trickier because sometimes I think people I think I have beautiful covers but mm-hmm. I they do not follow genre norms 
So yeah, your covers are gorgeous. I really like yeah, them. Yeah, they are. And actually, your tequila series, I was, when I, I read that series, so I love, I mean, you know, I've read the books in the series. It's not done, is it? You got, didn't you say you were going to finish that one up? Because in two yeah. weeks, my last one's going to be on that series. But yeah. um, I thought you were genius because they do, like the covers to me have a, a little bit of a Janet Ivanovich feel, the one for the money, too, which is genius. And then it's clear that it's um, paranormal or a little bit mystic or what, you know, crazy. Those books are hilarious. Um, but yeah. So I, I think that's genius. Those. I what? actually, I ended up recovering those. I, I think it was probably four or five books in and mm-hmm. I redid the whole series because I didn't think they were performing the way I wanted them to. Mm-hmm. And so they did have a little bit more of the kitschy cartoony covers to start, mm-hmm. but it just wasn't hitting. Like they had like tiki men on the front, mm-hmm. that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And it just wasn't hitting the notes that I wanted. And so mm-hmm. and that's the beauty of being indie. You can just go back and say, let's have a new look at them. And just, I recovered the whole series. Yeah. And now they're very um, font dominant, I guess you call it. I don't know what the term is, but it's like text, but you, I mean, it's amazing to look at them, what you can do just with text and pattern, I guess, would that be what you'd say is the main elements? Yeah. Just like a kind of a tropical pattern, but I wanted something in those that was bright and colorful and cheerful, but also that when you're scrolling on your phone and looking at a thumbnail, the font's so big that it pops out. Very Um, important. Yeah. 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 just wanted to grab people and yeah. I think the, I think it did a good job. So mm-hmm. I've been happy with those, but again, it's when I'm, I have psychics and witches and priestesses in that book and I do not have witches on the cover or psychic or anything like that. So yeah. it's not specifically falling in that sort of cozy mystery genre cover norm. So right. not something necessarily I recommend to everybody. So think, <laughs> think about it before you go that route. <laughs> I've just sort of always gone my own way and it, it's been okay for me, but it's tricky. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love that you were four, three or four books in when you changed the covers on that because it wasn't performing. I mean, everybody listen to that. She, <laughs> she went in and changed covers that she probably really liked yeah. and, and to something that is, she felt like would be more market appropriate and would help sell those books we cannot be precious about those things. We really, if you want to sell books, you need to get a cover that's going to be the right thing, even if you're three or four books in. So I've had to look at that too this week. So um, it's I- tough to, you know, step back and look at things as a product. But mm-hmm. after you gather enough data for a while, you have some choices to make, you know, right. is it in the right genres. Is it, is the cover really doing the job you want it to do? And right you as your blurb you know all of those things that is gives us such freedom in the indie world so and there are a lot of things you can do prior to the covers that don't cost you any money Mm -hmm. you know you can change your blurb you can change your subtitle you can um change the way you set up your facebook ads if they're not what you're performing or whatever but if all those you've done all that and it's still not working then the cover is the last you know that is the thing you you probably should tackle and, We're talking uh, about changing. I have sort of a book of my heart called Miss Bitch, which is yes, I've seen it. Yes, somewhat on my life. Um, and I that was one of my books that I wasn't very rational about, mm-hmm. and just was like, this is the way I'm doing it. And it's I can't advertise it. Um, I don't understand why because um, there's a really popular book out right now that's in all the editors' picks called Night Bitch, and that's on all of the Amazon editors lists and all over the Amazon advertising. So they're letting the trad pubs advertise with that that word in the title, but they're not letting me advertise with that word in the title. So we've talked to, because we run AMG lock screen ads, AMS, all of that. They will not let us do it. So we've had our hands tied a little bit there and I may have to make the hard choice of, do I republish it under a different title? If you, if you use the asterisk or, you know, substituted words for symbols in, would it be the same? We asked for, when we were in the meetings with our reps and we asked about the advertising and they said, no, but again, yeah. what's the, letting, yeah. the, the subtle art of not giving an F like yeah. that's all over the place. 
and they advertise that. But yeah, so there are a few things that the trad pubs get a little bit. They get a little bit better treatment with some things, but (laughs) I would still rather have the freedom and the flexibility that I have, like you were talking about earlier. So yeah. 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 So what about the opposite? Have you ever done something that you thought this is going to be it? This is a home run and it turned out not to be so great. Or just well, didn't was, thought. Yeah, that's kind of what I talked about earlier when I thought, okay, I'm I'm going to write these marketing guides and you know, this is this is going to take off because I haven't seen anything like this out there. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. I think there's yeah. still some floating around. I've tried to unpublish as much as I can. <laughs> yeah. So, Sometimes no. it can say it can seem like you know, a brilliant plan on paper, because I did that when I wanted to start writing fiction, I was like, okay, first I will write nonfiction <laughs> articles and I will do all these things that it wasn't fiction. And I was like, later I, I thought, why did I even try that? I d- didn't sell anything. Didn't get any, any responses, you know, but I was like, I'll do this. I felt like it was a stepping stone. Like I'll get some credits, you know, and then, yep. but, yeah. So sometimes it just best laid plans just, don't go that well sometimes. Right, so. right. I, know, I know. It's also the bright, shiny thing, you know, like yeah. just take your idea and run with it. And then later go, eh, maybe I should have just pa- like pumped the brakes a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we've already talked a little bit about some of the kind of changes that you've in thinking that you've gone through. So um, what's the biggest uh, mindset change you've had to make during your career? Do you think? Um, I think that was really just the taking myself seriously. So what we had talked about with putting boundaries up on my time, I have my own office space offsite. I actually bought a little studio down the road from me. Um, and I don't think a couple of years ago I would have given myself, you know, a few years ago, I probably wouldn't have given myself permission to do that. And honestly, it, I think doing that makes other people take you more seriously. And it's not just, you know, all these little romance books you write. I used to get that when I was starting out. Like, oh, those, what are those little, those little romance books you write? Just sort of people kind of poo pooing it a little bit. And now I can probably say, you know, I'm an author, I'm on a deadline, I protect my time, and I say no to things, and I don't really mentor people. And I have resources for people who reach out for help with mentoring, but just really taking what you do seriously. And I think that was a big mind shift for me. Which is interesting. And it kind of does bring us to our next question, which is more because you have a very laid back lifestyle. I do. <laughs> design, and it's designed that way. You know, you, um, you live on an island you scuba dive and that's part of your day. I mean, that's what, so tell us about that. Tell us how all of that came to be. How did you um, get this life life you wanted and how did you end up on an Island? So when I started designing in my head, what I wanted my day to look like, Mm -hmm. I had scuba diving in there. And that was one of those things that was, I don't want to just like work for the weekends. I want to have a, something I'm passionate about that I can incorporate into my life. But at the time I was living in Wisconsin. So scuba diving. <laughs> That's a long way <laughs> to go to scuba dive from Wisconsin. Yeah. You can do some great lakes diving with dry suits. Uh, it's very cold. So you can do some wreck diving. The lake diving there is very low visibility, not a ton to see. And so I started setting myself up for what is my future going to look like? And could, if, as this career takes off for me, where am I, I'm going to want to move, where am I going to want to live that can give me the lifestyle that I want? So at the time I was thinking the Florida Keys was really sort of the best, some of the best diving in the States aside from like California area. Mm -hmm. And so that is why I started writing my cozy mystery series. So I sent my main character is a psychic, but she's also a scuba diver and an underwater photographer. Mm -hmm. And I started, so I wrote some of my passions into my book Mm -hmm. and into that series. One, because I could business expense trips to the Keys for research. And I do recommend this for people who ever (laughs) need the business expense research. (laughs) Instead of doing like a small town Midwest, 
maybe do something really beautiful and fancy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you know, you get the really cool trip to go to your yes. research. Yeah. A, you know, small town Idaho or something. <laughs> yeah. Or small town <laughs> Texas. Yeah. Right. I like to set my books in like really pretty locations because then if I take trips there, then I can expense it. Um, So that was one of the things. So I pulled in this character that was doing the things that I wanted to be doing with my life. And I guess there was something to be said also for sort of manifesting what I wanted through my writing. Um, And I, (laughs) we talked about this briefly, but many of my readers believe that I manifested my fiance. (laughs) They are convinced that his, uh, I have a character in the Althea Rose series called Trace. He is my main character's love interest. Uh, He is a blonde scuba diving instructor. And a week after I divorced my husband, I treated myself to a trip to Cozumel and met my current fiance, Alan, who is a Scottish blonde scuba diving instructor. (laughs) (laughs) It all kind of worked together. It's all full circle. Yeah, we all come back to the full circle. That's all. That's amazing. I love that. And after I met him, we, because he's Scottish, we had to look at whether he would live in the United States and get some sort of visa or we could go somewhere that we both could live and work. And so that's where we kind of went through the different islands that I could get my dog safely to from the States. We picked Bonaire and from there that really manifested like the life that I was looking for. And so we moved down here and I've been living here ever since. And so I have brought my readers along with that as well by sharing all of my underwater photography, which my character in um, the Althea Rose series takes a lot of underwater photography, but it also ties in in the Siren Island series, all of my characters are mermaids. And so when I'm depicting underwater scenes there, I can then refer my readers back to, I call it mermaid view and I'll Mm -hmm. post all my underwater photos and people can get a look at basically what the mermaids would see or what an underwater photographer sees. And people love it. They, they open my newsletter for my Island photos. I get such a great open rate just because people are, they just, it's something maybe that they'll never do or they'll never try, or maybe always wanted to try. Right. So being able to share that and then tie it into my books has been really nice. That's, that's just great. And I, again, listeners, are there things you can do that you can tie into your books? They're your hobbies or your passion, a passionate hobby, but you can put in your books and then you can, you can use those things in all kinds of different marketing and reaching out and drawing readers in. So Mm -hmm. I just think that's great. So you talked about working with your, um, with your fiance though, right? Before we got on here, yes. you do work with him. We've, we've talked to a couple of people who have, Sarah and I are clearly on the, no, we would not work <laughs> with our husbands, but uh, tell us some about that, how that came to be and how you kind of split your duties and all of that. So we actually run two businesses together, which <laughs> creates oh, wow. an inter- a few interesting moments here and there. Uh, <laughs> So we run a guest house on the island as well as uh, Alan has taken over all of my advertising and marketing and financials. Mm-hmm. And so he's just really got a good head for spreadsheets and click through rates and all of the analytics that I just mm-hmm. don't want to deal with. And so he, you know, takes all of his time doing that. And then, but he's also manager of the guest house. So we put on different hats. So when guest house comes, then I'm doing some of the laundry and customer okay. servicing or taking the guests scuba diving. And it's it's been a good thing to have a diversified income during the pandemic because the guest house, obviously our borders were shut. We couldn't get off the island for over a year. Tourism was shut down. Um, and it was nice to have the income from the books to support us during that time. So I definitely do recommend diversifying your income if you can. But working together as a couple can be very tricky (laughs) there. (laughs) And particularly when you have two businesses that um, sometimes quite often need quick responses. If you're getting emails from the guest house or if an ad campaign is quickly, you know, outselling or spending too much money. I mean, there's things that just need responses. And so it's very hard to put up boundaries of, 
okay, we're in bed reading books, end of the night or watching a show, no work talk. And so we've had to put uh, like just a few code words or just things in place that like, this is for tomorrow or <laughs> I'm in the kitchen when yeah. I'm in the kitchen cooking, this does not mean it's a free time. You see me free away from the computer. And that now means that I'm available for work talk. That means <laughs> I am decompressing and making some dinner yeah. and don't want to talk work. So yeah. it's tricky. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. that goes like balancing. I think it's smart to have to, we always talk about multiple streams of income, but usually we're talking about like with writing, like different types of books, series, writing, but it's smart to diversify into something that's not writing related at all. Cause then you've got that going on. But um, so you got to balance all that, but then also in your writing, you're writing multiple genres. So how are you? Cause I know people are going to be saying, so how does she write these? Mm-hmm. Different- you have a schedule. I mean- yeah. So I, I, I think I initially just shot myself in the foot a little bit because <laughs> it was that shiny new thing uh, <laughs> going on. And I just wanted to, oh, this will be a good idea. And this will be fun to write. And it is, and this is actually something about I, the standalone I just wrote, you know, it doesn't sell as well as series, but there's something so pleasing about either write, starting a new world or writing a book where you don't have to remember any of the details <laughs> in any of the other series. And so I think what had initially started with bouncing between the series was it was sort of the shiny new thing. But then once I started building the series, I just, I kind of just rotated between each one. And I always set up a pre-order now and have for the past couple of years. And so it's really whatever the next pre-order is. And so I alternate between them all. And um, yeah, it's, you just got to take a lot of notes and figure out, I, I know which of my series are the best selling ones. And I know my readers would prefer that I would just always write in those series, but it's been kind of a palate cleanser for me to bounce right. between as well. And yeah. so. Yeah. And are your books in wide or KU or do you they little bit? They are in KU now. Mm -hmm. Um, They were not until, so what I did was I put the Althea Rose series in, let's see, I wrote that down. I think I put it in July of 2019. That was the first series I tested in KU. Mm -hmm. And it was doing about 400,000 page reads. So it was okay, but it wasn't enough for me to pull my other series from wide at the time. Mm -hmm. Now that series does about a million page reads, I think something like that. Um, then the pandemic hit and I thought about, Oh, people are going to be really struggling with money. Mm-hmm. Would this be a good time? I've built up a lot of series. I have good reviews. I have good credibility with my books. Is this a good time to try it out and just see maybe for three months, six months mm-hmm. while people are struggling and trying to make ends meet, maybe this would just be beneficial to everyone. And KU really, I think it like tripled my income. So I've stayed in it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the waters were fine. <laughs> so it's, it's been um, just over a year now that I've been in KU. Great. I've been yeah. an all, all-star every month since I've entered. Um, do something like 12 to 14 million page reads a month. And yeah, it's been really it's been good. And so it's, they're different. It's a different readership mm-hmm. for sure. There, I think people who are buying books versus who are in KU, mm-hmm. they're just different marketplaces. And that's something yeah. you just understand. Yeah. That's yeah. Very true. I love that. I love that. I love that you looked at everything and mm-hmm. um, not that KU, you know, we, we're, we're pretty much KU wide neutral here. <laughs> we, we do not take sides. Sarah is wide and I'm KU and there's a, there's a benefit to both and there's a place for both. And I just, I think it's great that you've taken advantage of that, especially during a time where things you were missing the income from your guest house and you were able to, you know, I would imagine make up for that a pretty good bit in KU. So that's great. I resisted KU for a long time because it was, I think it was the second or third month after I had finally decided to go full time as an author mm-hmm. that Amazon didn't pay me. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I was exclusive with Amazon or I hadn't really gained a 
foothold too much with the other vendors yet at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was just because of a, some sort of accounting error. So Mm -hmm. just, it wasn't anything, but again, you know how slow Amazon works with things. Mm -hmm. And I had, when I had decided to go full time, it was just enough to cover my mortgage, you know, bills, life expenses, but I was counting on that coming in and it did it. And so it was terrifying to me. And so when KU came about and everything, I just, you know, Amazon can change the rules at any time. And so that is a fear that is definitely there. And I still remember how that felt Mm -hmm. to not have that payment show up. Yeah. So I, I'm not, I'm not you, I'm not one who says you have to go KU or you have to do this. I have friends who do really well wide. Um, I think everyone needs to test what works for them or if they want to try, you know, three months in and see what happens. That's what I did. I mean, I just started testing with one series before I felt, you know, comfortable going in, but it's, and some people are doing fantastic wide. So I would never advocate no. One or the other. This is just what's worked for me. Excellent. Well, it's been great having you here. So our last question is, what do you think the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success has been? I think one of the best things I've done is from the beginning with my very first book. So I know I said I talked about the mentality of taking myself seriously. Mm-hmm. That's almost more of like an emotional mm-hmm. component of you know, your self-talk and the boundaries you put up. But from my very first book, The Stolen Dog, I had a professional cover designer. I had a website. I had a newsletter. I had a Facebook page. I was gathering details. I was doing the marketing. I treated it like a business from day one. Mm -hmm. So any of the books that I did after that, I treated them the same. I, I detached the emotional aspect the best I could and treated it like a product. And I've been gathering emails from day one. I've been building my pages and everything. And I think that's really important to do. I know a lot of, I quite often hear a lot of authors like, oh, I'll start a newsletter next or I'll I'll get emails another, you know, in a a few months. Or Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think another big thing is telling myself that you don't have to do all the things. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really easy to be overwhelmed. Yep. So, and there's so many shiny new things. I should be doing the TikTok and Pinterest <laughs> and I should be blogging and video blogging and everything. And you can get a little overwhelmed yep. when you hear there's some authors that are doing so much. But ultimately, I just realized for me, my most important thing is writing the next book, mm-hmm. my newsletter, and engaging with my readers. And when I get a little too overwhelmed or try to do too much, I always return back to that. And that's the core of my business. And that's what's driving my business. And so from day one, I treated it as such. That is just such a wonderful answer. I think that, um, I think a lot of people need to hear that sometimes, especially the narrowing it down to what these things are. You know, I certainly try to do all the things too. And uh, you're right. Just next book, readers and your newsletter, those are. Yeah, I think you picked the the three best because yeah. really that's what's going to keep you going for yep. the long term. So yeah, very good. Very, very good reminders for us all. <laughs> so, well, where can people find out more about you and your books? Um, TrishaOmalley.com. And then I'm on Facebook and Instagram at Trisha O'Malley Author. Okay, cool. All right, great. Yeah. Thank well, you we'll for having all me. Those links, yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Talking you're welcome. To us. We, I have wanted to have you on since I read uh, started your tequila books, and then we were in a clubhouse group <laughs> together, and I was like, "That's Trisha O'Malley." So, I was yeah. laughing that day, <laughs> like, "Hi, Jamie." <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll have all the links at Wish I'd Known Them Podcast dot com, and thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast. And we'll see y'all next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Them Podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.